Welcome to the Cybersecurity TLDR show, where we save you time by providing you the too long didn't read summary of cybersecurity topics and news. You can find us on YouTube through video and all the popular podcasting platforms for audio on the go. Now let's get over to your host, John Good. Hello, 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 and welcome, welcome, welcome. I am John Yud, and here we are going to do the Threat Intel Briefing for August 21st, 2022 through August 27th, 2022. Hope you're having a great day if you're joining us live. Great morning, great afternoon, great evening, wherever you're at. If you're watching on replay on YouTube, I appreciate it. Make sure that you leave a like comment and subscribe if you enjoy the content, if you want to see other types of content, if you like what we're doing, if you want to see different changes, things like that. Also, if you are actually listening on podcasting platform, because we are available on all the podcasting platforms, make sure to subscribe and leave us a review as well. Same thing. Let us know how we're doing and if there's anything that you think that we can uh, do better. And uh, also, too, in the description, make sure uh, to check out the link to the show notes where I'll have the links to different articles and things like that related to this episode. So that way, if you want to go look deeper into it, uh, I know that we don't always get a chance to go really deep into some of these articles, especially the really technical kind of stuff. But um, I will include the links to the articles as well. So uh, without any further delay, we're going to go ahead and jump into the articles here. So first article, an encrypted zip file can have two correct passwords, and here's why. Uh, So a cybersecurity researcher at Positive Technology shared over the weekend, so last weekend, that a simple experiment where he produced a password-protected zip file called XZIP. So if you're familiar with zip files, you can put a password on there, and then the only way you can unzip it is to enter the password. The password that the researcher picked for encrypting his zip was a pun on the 1987 hit password that became a popular tech meme. And then see the article for the actual password that they included in there. But the researcher demonstrated that when extracting XZIP using a completely different password, he received no error messages. Well, that's not good, right? Uh, How is this possible? So it says, when producing the password-protected ZIP archives with AES-256 mode enabled, the zip format uses pbkdf2 algorithm and hashes the password provided by the user. If the password's too long, so here's where the, the issue comes in. If the password's too long, and by too long, they mean uh, longer than 64 bytes of characters. Instead, uh, the user, uh, instead of the user's chosen password, so the password that he picked, this newly calculated hash becomes the actual password value of the, uh, of the file. So you can use both, right? And then when the user uh, attempts to extract the file and enters a password that's longer than 64 bytes, the user's input will once again be hashed by the zip application and compared against the correct password, which is now itself a hash. A match would lead to successful file extraction. So that's dangerous, right? Because with any kind of password protection or anything like that, that should not be the case. With encryption, so something like symmetric encryption, right? We have uh, one password, one key, right? That's the only thing that's supposed to work. Uh, When you use asymmetric, then you have two keys and then there's a little bit of difference of how that works. But symmetric encryption, one key, one way to unlock it. If you have two, you know, obviously that's a serious issue. It's not as bad as three, right? I guess. (laughs) But uh, it provides, you know, another way to actually get into the file, into the system, whatever. So, I mean, that's pretty serious. Uh, I don't know, you know, what kind of things people are zipping and using password protected, uh, password protection on. I'm sure a lot of things. And, you know, that, that's just serious. I don't know any other way to put it. Um, there's not much that you can do, you know, as the end user, because obviously you can make a longer password and then it's still going to create those two values uh, or use those two values to unlock it. But, um, you know, I guess look for another way to do it other than using zip files, you know. Uh, Next article, White Hat hackers broadcasted talks and hacker movies through a decommissioned satellite. During the latest edition of DEF CON Hacking Conference in Las Vegas, the group of White Hat hackers, uh, Shady Tell, demonstrated how to take control of a satellite in geostationary orbit. 
The group call, uh, used a satellite called a Nick F1R, which is a de- which was decommissioned in 2020. The group was authorized to perform the hack of the satellite. They hacked uh, had been decommissioned, which means that the uh, that it's going to send a great. Uh, send it to a graveyard orbit. Graveyard orbit, also called a junk orbit, is basically just where they put like space junk, right? Um, and then uh, one of the members of the group, Carl Kosher, explained that they had access to an unused uplink facility, which included the hardware to connect a satellite. Kosher explained that it's quite easy to find the hardware to connect to the satellite. The group used a HackRF uh, software to find radio peripheral cable capable of transmission or reception of radio signals from one megahertz to six megahertz, software's cheap. Costs around six hundred bucks, or three. Sorry, three hundred bucks. <laughs> uh, you know, for three hundred bucks, if you can communicate with a satellite, that's a pretty serious issue, right? Um, I didn't see in here if it said something about, you know, like that satellite was super obsolete, and then that's why it was taken down, so that other satellites don't have that technology. But I have to believe that that's probably a consistent kind of technology that they have in there. And for 300 bucks, if you can get into that satellite, you know, that's a huge issue. You can change the orbit so you can make it run into stuff in space, which is an issue uh, that creates more debris, more junk out there, especially if it's in like the normal orbit instead of this junk orbit. Um, and then also, you know, if you could uh, get it to get closer to like Earth, right? And then it gets sucked in by the gravity and then it crashes somewhere, right? That's another serious issue. So, uh, but. Pretty cool. Uh, just the ability to, um, you know, find that vulnerability from a security perspective, right? Uh, Lloyd's of London to exclude state-backed attacks from cyber insurance policies. So this one's really important, especially for people that are making any kind of decisions related to risk or, you know, should we use cyber insurance or anything like that? Insurance marketplace, uh, marketplace Lloyd's of London is set to introduce cyber insurance exclusions the coverage for catastrophic state-backed uh, ba- yeah, attacks from 2023. In a market bulletin published on August 16th, 2022, Lloyd stated that whilst it remains strongly supportive of the writing of cyber attack cover, it recognizes the cyber-related business uh, continues to be an evolving risk. We know this, right? Um, you know, one of the issues with cyber insurance is a lot of people uh, kind of started to rely on cyber insurance, right? Like, so instead of doing best practices, maybe we just get cyber insurance and they can cover it. And then they'll pay for all the, you know, the um, the fees and the fines and everything related to that hack. So it says, therefore, the company will require all its insurer groups to apply a suitable clause excluding liability for losses arising from any state-backed cyber attack in accordance with several requirements. The move is reflective of a maturing and quickly evolving cyber insurance market. So again, right? All the companies rush to try to get cyber insurance. They try to uh, get the insurance companies to pay for the cyber attacks instead of doing best practices. Well, insurance companies are getting smart, right? Because they're tired of getting burned, I'm sure. Because, you know, why, why would you allow that to continue, right? Insurance companies, you know, they're, they have a, um, they have a solid business model as far as how they operate, right? Because typically you pay like a premium, a monthly, a yearly, whatever premium. And then uh, you're paying for that ability when you, you know, you have something happen and then they will come in and, you know, repair it, pay you, whatever, right? Just like car insurance, in an accident, then you get your car repaired. Um, But, you know, you have to comply with any kind of restrictions or clauses or anything that's in that policy in order to be covered. So if you've ever had like a cell phone insurance, I know that's a, that's a pretty big one, right? Or even I think car insurance, like if you leave your uh, if you leave your car unlocked, then I think that negates some of the insurance um, coverage, right? Because you left it unlocked, you didn't do your due diligence to actually lock your car, uh, or if you left your keys in the car, I think that also maybe negates some of the insurance, but. You know, this is another example. I'm sure there's going to be some stuff in there about doing uh, some frameworks or, um, you know, certain kinds of controls, policies, having some kind of auditing. I'm sure there's going to be all kinds of stuff in there, right? And there should be because that's reasonable. To me, I mean, we'll have to see, you know, what exactly is included in some of these kind of uh, clauses or exclusions because. 
I think you could go extreme, right? Like you could make it very difficult to comply. And then that's going to be an issue because, you know, companies are having a hard enough time securing their organization anyways. But if you start putting these super restrictive clauses or uh, very specific clauses, you know, that could be an issue. Like for instance, right? Let's say it says you have to have the entire risk management framework, the NIST 837, 35, all the 53, you know, all those, uh, you have to have that entire thing implemented. Well, that's going to be an issue, right? That's very cost prohibitive. So you're going to spend a ton of money just to be covered, right? Maybe it's not worth it at that point. But, um, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see how this kind of plays out and what they put in there. Hopefully it's reasonable, right? Because I mean, I definitely agree that there are best practices and things that you should do. And if you don't do them, well, why would you get covered for hacking, like for hacks and attacks and things like that? That doesn't make sense. That's just, you're offloading all that responsibility or trying to at least. So we'll see how this plays out. Let's see here. Uh, DevSecOps gains traction, but security still lags. Software developers and operation teams continue to adopt DevOps and other agile methodologies, as well as automation and low code services, but they still struggle with security, the fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic and a shortage of skilled security workers, according to a newly published annual survey from GitLab. DevSecOps results in better code quality, higher developer productivity, and improved operational efficiency, according to the survey of more than 5,000 software developers, operational specialists, and application security professionals. Security still is a problem. However, with more than half, so 57% of those surveyed, considered security to be a perform, uh, performance metric, nearly the same number said it was difficult to get devs to actually prioritize fixing code vulnerabilities. Survey conducted by the toolchain provider underscores that all participants in the development and deployment process still need to improve the communications and relationships between groups says Jonathan Hunt, Vice President of Information Security and Cybersecurity at GitLab. So if you don't know what DevOps is, you don't know what DevSecOps uh, is, basically it's this idea of rapid deployment. So you're you know, rapidly deploying things, you're creating things, doing all this stuff. And then you're running uh, with DevSecOps, you know, you're running all these security checks and things like that. So it's all automated. So you can rapidly deploy things. That's the basic idea of it, right? Um, so it's very uh, integrated with developers because, you know, it's a lot of code. It's a lot of automation kind of stuff. And so all of that has to be built in, has to be configured and, you know, set up. Uh, so that is for sure the way that a lot of organizations are going and how things are kind of evolving, because especially with cloud, it makes it so easy to do a lot of this stuff. Uh, you know, I say easy in the broad, broad, uh, broad terms because you obviously have to know how to do it and things like that. So I guess the initial barrier isn't necessarily easy because you got to learn all that stuff. But um, you know, it just makes it repeatable. It makes it uh, consistent, and it's a very good thing, right? Um, and even it says in here, better code quality, higher productivity, all that stuff, right? Um, but you know, we're still kind of having the same problem, right? where security developers and all these different areas aren't really talking. And, you know, that, that's an issue among all organizations. There's so many organizations that don't have a good working relationship between those groups. And some of them are working on it. Some of them say they're working on it and they're not. <laughs> um, but, you know, in order to be successful, especially in that kind of environment, you have to work together. If you don't work together and you don't communicate, you don't keep those communication lines open, you don't foster those relationships and do all the things that you need to do to make it a good working relationship. Yeah, I mean, you're not going to be that successful. It's going to continue to have issues. And even this, so it says difficult to get devs to uh, actually prioritize fixing code vulnerabilities. To me, that is a prioritization issue, right? That reminds me or makes me think of that you have these two different areas that aren't talking or communicating and jointly creating priorities, right? So, uh, you know, Joe Schmo over here has, you know, is in charge of IT or in charge of the developers. 
and Sally Smith is in charge of security and you know, they're not talking to each other. Not, they're not creating these, um, these team prioritizations. Uh, you know, that's an issue. And if you don't talk and you don't do the right things, you know, that's going to happen and you're going to continue to be vulnerable. You're going to continue to push out code that's vulnerable and you're never going to get to where you really want to be. So talk to your developers, talk to your team, your insecurity, talk to the other teams, build relationships. If you're on the other teams, build relationships with everybody. Got it. Sweet. (laughs) So, you know, it's amazing. Like I remember that this has been an ongoing issue for so long. Like this is not like a year long thing where some of these departments don't talk to each other. Uh, you know, like this is like a long thing. So, uh, let's see here. Air gap devices can send covert more signals via network card LEDs. Uh, A security researcher who has a long line of work demonstrating novel data exfiltration methods from air gap systems has come up with yet another technique that involves sending Morse code signals via LEDs on network interface cards. So Nix, uh, the approach co- uh, codenamed Ether, Etherled, so Ether LED, comes from Dr. Uh, Madorchai Guri, the head of R&D in the cybersecurity research in the Ben Gurion University of uh, Negev in Israel, who recently outlined Gyroscope. Uh, gyroscope, a method of transmitting data electronically, uh, ult- sorry, ultrasonically to the smartphone gyroscopes. Gyroscopes. Uh, that's a, that's a lot, a lot of words to say that I don't normally see. <laughs> uh, malware installed on the device could program programmatically control the status LED or blinking uh, by blinking or alternating its colors using un- uh, using documented methods or undocumented firmware commands. Information can be encrypted via simple encoding, such as Morse code, and modulated over those optic signals. An attacker can intercept and decode these signals from tens to hundreds of meters away. So, you know, uh, we saw another example of kind of doing this air gap data transmission. Uh, I think it was maybe like three, four weeks ago in one of those episodes. We talked about it, another method. But this is actually using LEDs to, to do kind of the same thing to transmit data. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's certainly interesting. A lot of these air-gapped vulnerabilities like this where they can transmit data like that, uh, they involve you actually having to compromise the system first. So what air-gapped is, is basically it means it's not physically connected to something else. So like if I have... Uh, development network A, and then I have the corporate network, you know, over here, this is not connected to this. So the development network is not physically connected to any of the equipment that connects into the corporate network. And so that's basically what air gapped is. It's completely isolated. Uh, So you would physically have to have access to that network in order to compromise it first in order to be uh, accomplished something like this. But you know, it's interesting, uh, definitely from a, like a data exfiltration kind of, kind of mindset, or if you can send data, right? Like that's another interesting thing. If I can send data to something that, um, send data to something that is, uh, air gapped and actually get it to execute commands or something, then, you know, that's definitely serious. Uh, think about, you know, like, uh, critical infrastructure kind of systems, right? Like if a SCADA system or something is completely isolated and I can do that to that system from miles away or something, you know, that's, that's a big deal. All right. Uh, let's see here. The Pentagon may require vendors certify their software is free of unknown flaws. Experts are split. Should the Pentagon require the vendors only sell the military software that's free of known vulnerabilities or defects that could cause security problems? 
On the surface, it seems like a reasonable request, but the security researcher Jerry Gamblin tweeted a screenshot of the House of uh, Representative Software Vulnerability Provisions from within the massive 2023 National Defense Authorization Bill passed July 14th. It divided the cybersecurity community. The debate boils down to two key arguments. The requirement is unnecessary and impossible to achieve or a game-changing move that will begin holding software vendors accountable for selling faulty technology. Biden administration is on the side of holding software vendor, vendors responsible for making sure that goods don't contain known vulnerabilities and exposures or CVEs. The software industry should emulate the automotive industry where the manufacturers retain ownership and responsibility through the life of the vehicle, said Ann Newberg. Newberger, uh, Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber and Emerging Technologies. So one of the issues that I see with this, you know, in general, right, is whenever, you know, like the government implements something like this, that tends to create a, um, a longer timeline, right? Like that introduces more steps, more things to do, and it makes it much more difficult. So, you know, if you're going to, evaluate things, especially like on an ongoing basis, like let's say patches or something. And it just, uh, yeah. I mean, I definitely agree that uh, vendors should continue to update their software. They should continue to make, you know, the effort to fix vulnerabilities and things like that. And maybe, you know, maybe something like this is just an extra driver. Uh, the commercial environments definitely would you know, benefit from this, right? Because if the government starts enforcing this, and especially if it's a major piece of software, you know, a lot of companies are going to want to try to comply with that so that they can be purchased and used by the government. But we'll, we'll see, uh, you know, we'll see, you know, it, it always makes me eerie when I start seeing things like this implemented. Cause again, it's just, it's going to introduce time. It's going to make that process longer, especially initially, right? Initially, things are always going to be longer when you implement a process like this because you got to work out the bugs. So I'm guessing that there's going to be you know, a decent amount of pushback on this just because it makes sense, right? <laughs> so uh, let's see here. Next article. Uh, hackers target hotel and travel companies with fake reservations. A hacker tracked at TA558 has upped their activity this year, running phishing campaigns and targeted multiple hotels and firms in the hospitality and travel space. The threat actor uses a set of 15 distinct malware families, usually remote access Trojans, rats, to gain access to the target systems, perform surveillance, steal, steal key data, and eventually siphon money from customers. TA558 has been active since at least 2018, but Proofpoint has recently seen an uptick in its activities, possibly linked to rebound of tourism after two years of COVID restrictions. So, I mean, that makes sense. You know, some of the hospitality industries are starting to get attacked again because, you know, people are starting to travel again, right? Now there's more data. Um, you know, with hospitality and hotels and things like that, it's always interesting because you can, uh, you know, you can kind of gather a lot of information, right? Customer goes there, stays there. Uh, if it's a high priority target, maybe you get information about where they're going. If it's a personal trip, if it's a business trip, you know, it all gives you information, right? Obviously, they're trying to steal money and do other things, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's not surprising that they would go after that, uh, just specifically because there's a lot of information, right? Credit card information. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else. What other kind of information? I mean, if you took over their like their Wi-Fi network, right? You could probably get some interesting information, get people connecting to those networks, try to analyze that data, see what you're, you know, what those people are visiting, and uh, yeah. So, but uh, not surprising. Let's see here. Uh, this is a good one. Hackers adopt Silver Toolkit as a Cobalt Strike alternative. Uh, threat actors are dumping the Cobalt Strike penetration testing suite in favor of similar frameworks that are less known. Uh, after Brute Re uh, Retel, the open source cross-platform cross uh, kit called Silver, it is becoming an attractive alternative. However, malicious activity using Silver can be detected 
using hunting queries drawn from analyzing the toolkit, uh, how it works in its components. So this is not super surprising. Typically with attackers, you know, they, they look for, I would say less known uh, attack vectors because one of the things is especially that, um, you know, we operate a lot on signatures, right? And if you don't know what a signature is, a signature is basically a known attack. It's a known pattern, basically. So uh, this type of attack takes these actions, right? Or makes files named this, like it renames files, whatever, right? Like that's a signature. And so, you know, if a tool is really getting identified and easily detected, then it makes sense that attackers are going to use alternative methods or find other ways to do things. We even see, um, we see tools and exploits and malware and things like that rebranded, right? So we've seen companies, ba or uh, not companies, but malicious groups basically rename themselves. And, uh, you know, they, they're a different group, but they have a lot of similarities, right? Like it's probably the same group. Uh, so we see that pretty frequently, um, you know, especially when things are mainstream and they just start getting, um, they get, start getting stopped, right? Like that's the key. They start getting stopped then that's when they start trying to shift. If they're not getting stopped, then they'll just continue and continue and continue. You know, just how it is. So uh, next article, voters in UK cast ballots online in tests for internet voting. Members of the UK's ruling conservative party who are voting to decide the country's next prime minister are for the first time casting ballots online in a leadership election, a rarity among democracies wary of internet voting because of cybersecurity concerns. Over a several week period, the party's offering internet voting alongside voting by mail in part to provide greater convenience during August weeks and Britain's take vacations, uh, when Britons take vacations and to avoid disruptions by striking postal workers. The results are to be announced September 5th. So, uh, in the United States, I think we're a long ways off from doing online voting personally, but uh, it's interesting, right? We do voting by mail here in the U.S. and there's you know all kinds of uh, controversies and you know conspiracy stories and you know debates on uh, doing even voting by mail, right? Um, but I mean, it's interesting, right? Voting online like that would certainly be a convenience kind of thing where you don't even have to mail something in uh, and then you don't have to rely on the post office and all this stuff. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out because I'm sure they have all kinds of skepticism about this <laughs> because it makes sense, right? Like online, especially one of the problems is, you know, being able to, uh, to confirm the validity of the results, right? Like showing that there was no hack, showing that these are legitimately the votes of those specific people. You know, that's a serious undertaking. Uh, and, you know, I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know how you can necessarily confirm that. I mean, I guess we'll see, um, but how you can confirm that person, like at least with the, uh, the mail-in ballots. So like in the US, you have to actually like sign it and provide a number and they'll confirm, you know, if there's an issue uh, about your vote right? They'll call you and whatever. So I'm not sure how this is going to work because, you know, there's no physical signature. Are you going to give people uh, certificates or keys or something that they have to use in order to sign this? I guess that's going to be, um, you know, I guess that's going to be an issue that we'll have to see how it plays out, but that'll be interesting, right? Uh, Israeli spyware company NSO Group CEO steps down. So if you've been watching this show for a while or you've seen some of the other episodes, we've talked about uh, you know, spyware, especially from Israeli Pegasus, NSO Group, all this stuff before. But uh, Israeli spyware from NSO Group said on Sunday its chief executive, Shalev Hulio, is stepping down with immediate effect uh, with uh, Chief Operating Officer Yaron Shohat appointed to oversee a re reorganization of the company before a successor is named. Source in the company confirmed that around 100 employees will be let go as part of the form's reorganization and that Shohat will lead the company until the board appoints a new CEO. Surveillance firm, which makes the Pegasus software, right, has been contending with legal action after allegations that its tools were misused by governments and other agencies to hack mobile phones. 
So that is why we've talked about Pegasus before. Uh, it's a spyware, and usually governments and certain agencies use it to target other people. It's pretty known. And there was even an article, oh, I don't know, a month or two ago, I think it was a couple months ago, where um, a contractor, defense contractor here in the United States, uh, L3, L3, uh, L3 Harris, they were talking to try to buy uh, Pegasus, right? So they've been all over the news. It's interesting to see their CEO stepping down, though. Um, I'm guessing that that was probably a forced kind of thing. You know, it probably wasn't uh, something that he chose to do, or maybe, you know, he's like, I don't know, like where this is going. But um, it's always interesting if you can find out why, like the behind the scenes reasons why, right? Like maybe he's stepping down because they couldn't sell to another uh, another government. Maybe he's not doing a good job of uh, really, you know, getting a lot of people to buy the software. Don't know. I don't know if we'll ever find out, but uh, that's definitely an interesting thing to see. And it seems like there's always articles about NSO Group. Like every week, I feel like there's an article or every other week. So they are always in the news. It's crazy. So uh, that's going to be the last article for today. If you're watching on YouTube and you're watching live, I appreciate you sticking with me for this episode and make sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know how you enjoyed it. If you want me to change things, do other things, uh, do other content on the channel, right? Uh, this is not just stuff about this, ep uh, this episode, this show. So make sure to do that. If you're watching on replay, same thing. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know how you enjoyed it or if there's things that we can do differently. And then also, if you're listening on podcasting platform, because we're on Spotify, iTunes, all that stuff, uh, make sure to subscribe and leave me a comment. Let me know how things are going as well. And uh, with that, that's going to be it for this week. I want to thank you for joining and I will